Welcome to the CDA Institute's Expert Series, the podcast that brings you in-depth conversations with the brightest minds in defense, security, foreign policy, and international relations. Each week, we delve into the most pressing issues facing our world today. In today's episode, Vivek Dehigia, Associate Professor of Economics at Carleton University, discusses the consequences of diplomatic tensions between Canada and India, the implications of India revoking diplomatic immunity from Canadian diplomats, the implications for our bilateral relationships, as well as India's role in counterbalancing against China and Asia and the Indo-Pacific, and the influence of diaspora politics on current tensions between India and Canada. This is the Expert Series. Dr. Dehigia, thanks for joining me today for the program. You're one of many experts I'm speaking with this week about the growing tensions between Canada and India. I'm hoping we can cover, you know, the recent diplomatic spat between Canada and India, essentially its implications, as well as dive a bit deeper into the Canada-India relationship, why it's important especially in the Indo-Pacific, and with this backdrop of a quite rapidly shifting and changing global order. I think by this point, most of our listeners will probably be familiar with some of the antecedents of the current diplomatic tensions, uh, which began with the assassination allegations levied against the Indian government and the ensuing uh, retaliation measures. That said, I'm wondering if you can set the scene for us by explaining the impact of the recent diplomatic tensions between Canada and India, and their impact on bilateral relations, and what implications they have for international diplomacy. Well, what's happened really is completely unprecedented. Uh, I would say that at this point, Canada-India bilateral is in, you know, has been in free fall really uh, since uh, Mr. Trudeau's kind of explosive announcements in Parliament or the allegation that India was, you know, probably involved with this with this killing uh, of of uh, the the Sikh uh, the Sikh Khalistani activist uh, in BC back in the summer. And then, you know, we know things went from bad to worse. There were the tit-for-tat diplomatic expulsions. Uh, India took the very major step of stopping all visas for people from Canada. Uh, so there are lots of people who wanted to go for, you know, for reasons of to meet family or work or business. Uh, simply can't go unless you have an existing visa uh, or or what they call OCI card, just kind of kind of like a like a long run visa. So it's killed all of that travel. And most recently, of course, India uh, uh, asked Canada to draw down the the embassy, the the the, uh, the staff at at the High Commission, uh, and 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 the missions uh, by two thirds, uh, and there was a back and forth uh, sort of uh, you know uh, with with uh, with uh, our our foreign minister uh, 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 saying that India violated the the the. Uh, the rules of the Vienna Conve- uh, Convention, rather, and then and then uh, Mr. Mr. Jay Shankar uh, saying no. In fact, India was entirely within the rules of of the of the convention. And then I don't I don't know if you if you caught this or, or your viewers, or, but a couple of days ago he gave a, a a press conference in New Delhi where he sort of dropped a hint that India had some evidence. Uh, of what he claimed was interference by 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 our diplomats uh, at their end, which was the reason for the, you know, the the expulsion of so many of them, and he said that you know there'll be more stuff coming out. I mean, those were his words. Uh, so that's that's fairly ominous, um, and who knows what will happen, you know, if and when that comes out. So you know, in short, this is the worst it's been, really, since 1947. Uh, when when India came into being uh, as as a new uh, state, uh, and I don't see things improving here uh, really at all. I, I think it's it's going to probably get worse. How do these recent events affect the perception of Canada and India on the global stage, and what are the implications for their standing in the international community? No, that's a very important question. I mean, and I, I should say that I'll just speak briefly to what I what I didn't answer from your first question, which is. More broadly, in terms of this kind of shift towards India in the Indo-Pacific region, you know, again, we have to take the big picture view here that China is increasingly belligerent and aggressive, uh, is a threat to the sort of global rules-based system and, and so on. And the US, Canada, Australia, Britain, you know, Europe really, really are trying to uh, have be bring bring India, bring India into their their orbit more than it has been, you know, it, uh, that historically India has been basically uh, not especially close uh, to the West. That's been changing. Uh, and so this comes at a really unfortunate time for Canada in particular, because, you know, I mean, I mean, given the state of what has happened in the last, uh, what, month or so or, or, or more, uh, there really is no strategy that we have meaningfully now 
with India. Uh, and that's extremely unfortunate. Now, you know, in terms of how the two countries are seen on the world stage, uh, I think that if you look at what, what what's come from the U.S. and the allies, there's a bit of mixed messaging, you know, that they that they say that they stand with Canada and, and India, and these allegations are very serious and must be investigated. Um, and there have obviously been leaks from, from, from somewhere, possibly Washington or from here, uh, about the Five Eyes intelligence and so on that, that apparently you know backs up uh, Trudeau's claims. Uh, but then they're always quick to, to, to say you know that, that they, they haven't condemned India uh, and they want to uh, you know partner with India. So I think they, you know in short, uh, our allies have been really walking a tightrope here that you know they, Canada is, is, is a long time ally going back to the war if, you know if not before. Uh, but India is an important new ally. So it's really put them in a very awkward, uh, awkward spot. What role, if any, has domestic diaspora politics played in shaping Canada's foreign policy decisions in regard to the dispute with India? I think it's played an absolutely huge role. I mean, I've, I've, uh, I've written about this extensively over the years. Uh, my, you know, my, my contention would be that, well, of course, diaspora uh, politics is is important really really you know across party lines uh but particularly for this government uh in my view in in my judgment they have they really have subordinated foreign policy and and Canada's strategic interests globally uh through the lens of diaspora uh politics in terms of you know which groups they would like to Placate, uh, where where they are a big source of votes for the liberals, uh, Sikh Canadians, while they're not large in numbers, are heavily concentrated in ridings in you know uh, in Vancouver, Toronto uh, areas, and therefore they are consequential, and they have been very loyal liberal voters uh, over the years. So, uh, if you look at Trudeau's track record uh, on the India file, uh, it's always been. Uh, to subordinate the big picture that is Canada's long-term and you know and and, and important interests uh, in in Asia, uh, with placating uh, uh, quite quite frankly Sikh voters back home, and that happened in, in with with this very gaff ridden you know failed visit to India back I guess it was twenty eighteen, uh, where you know the ultimate sort of. Uh, uh, Poor optics is 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 really a understatement. Where a former convicted uh, Khalistani terrorist was added to the guest list for for the High Commission's final reception, uh, and that was just hugely embarrassing that that happened. So yes, regrettably, I think uh, this government uh, has been worse than than most in really prioritizing diaspora grievances uh, over having a serious, uh, you know, kind of. Uh, serious, serious realpolitik, uh, big picture view uh, of of, uh, of of not just India, but but you know uh, that that whole region more more broadly. Josh, you said, and I'm paraphrasing here that we sort of uh, we're sort of prioritizing diaspora politics above what should be our national interests. That said, I'm wondering if you can build on that, and from your perspective, what would you say our interests in the Indo-Pacific? Are or rather, you know, what should they be, and what do you think we should be pursuing, perhaps from an economic standpoint? Yeah, no, that that's a very good question. So, uh, you know, again, what we should be doing for for one thing, the government's own Indo Indo Pacific strategy, you know, document from from last year, in theory, suggests India should be important. You know, we have we have we have to pivot away from China, uh, but they're they, but they've done the opposite. So that the you know we have had these ongoing trade negotiations. Uh, that have gone on almost for now 10 or 15 years, you know, and those are basically dead uh, because of this present crisis. Uh, Canada is not part of, you know, of, of the, I, I, the the quad grouping that uh, brings together, I believe it's the, U, the US, the UK, Australia, and India. Uh, you know, where are we? we we're, we're, we're just not at that table. We're just missing an action. Um, so I think there's been a huge missed opportunity here uh to engage with india and i think what you know what canada and 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 i think that that uh Pudo and and people around have missed really uh is that uh india is not 
the India of, of, of 2023 is not the India of 20 years ago or even 10 years ago. It's now a rising power on the world stage. It's once again, the fastest growing major economy in the world, you know, with China faltering. Um, India has been courted assiduously by the US, by, by the UK, Australia, everyone really. Uh, and and I think that I think that Trudeau fundamentally misinterpreted uh, uh, our power vis-a-vis -vis India. India is now uh, it's very clear on, under 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 Modi uh, has no intention that India will be pushed around and bullied by sort of a a, a kind of middle power. Uh, you know they they want to be they're they're at the big table as far as they're concerned with with the U.S. and so forth. So I think you know very very major failure. Uh, by by our government uh, on this file. Do you think the situation might be different now uh, had Trudeau not resorted to uh, such a major public announcement in regards to the accusation? And how could it be different maybe if it had gone through different channels? Uh, do you think there was potentially a better approach that we didn't employ here? No, that that's, uh, 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 I, I think, uh, 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 a very important question. Absolutely, you know, had this been done quietly through through diplomatic back channels, through allies, uh, it would have been very, very different. Uh, even if, for example, uh, Trudeau had said not on the opening day of the of the fall session of Parliament, if it was, you know, the, with this dramatic announcement, even if he'd said, look, you know, we are investigating credible allegations that certain foreign powers and and not name and shame anyone. Uh, have perhaps been uh, involved with with uh, with with activities here in Canada which are problematic or something to that effect, and then uh, pursued it quietly uh, through allies through back channels. We wouldn't have had this current downturn. I mean, we we already had a very poor relationship after his failed visit to India, and let's not forget that India took very uh, very unkindly to what they saw as Trudeau interfering in their in their uh, internal affairs when he was commenting in favor of the farmer protests uh, in, in India a couple of years ago. Uh, Punjabi farmers were protesting. Trudeau made, made his announcement to a diaspora gathering, by the way, uh, and, and they didn't take kindly to that. And then, of course, there was a certain amount of schadenfreude in India when Trudeau invoked, invoked emergency powers to crack down on 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 on, on protests here, and 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 they were like, hey, you know, uh, you were trying to tell us to talk and, and negotiate with these protesters, then look what you did uh, a few a few months later. Um, so it, it's been very very poorly handled by by Trudeau. I, I can see no possible reason uh, apart from playing to the diaspora gallery back home, why he would make the announcement on the first day of parliament. There was, there was, there was just no need for that. This could have been handled quietly, diplomatically, uh, the way it's handled with allies. You know, you, you stand up in parliament and accuse North Korea or Russia, you know, or, or you know, some kind of rogue state, the world's largest democracy, who is supposedly our ally. Uh, that made no sense. Uh, in terms of geopolitics and strategy, it made sense in terms of, of purely diaspora grievance uh, politics. Assuming that Canada and India may very well patch up our relationship at some point and, and move beyond this incident, or I suppose, assuming that this incident didn't occur, I'm wondering how could Canada and India collaborate to promote regional stability and security in the Indo-Pacific, uh, particularly in light of China's growing influence, and how might this dispute impact Canada's position or interest in the Indo-Pacific? Uh, on, on that hypothetical I, I just think that that's so remote a possibility at this, at this time that I don't think that as long as Trudeau is prime minister, quite frankly, uh, or Modi is at the other end. But I think Modi here is less important because, you know, one thing that, that you know, that, that should be pointed out is that this is not about Modi, that all, that basically everyone in, in, in India is united on this, that they don't, uh, that they, that they you know did not take kindly to this to this alleg this un as yet unproven allegation. Uh, so I simply cannot envisage at this point a world where Trudeau and Modi can sit down you know at the same table uh, and do kind of any any meaningful deals uh, of Canada and India cooperating in the region. I think we will have to wait for a new government, frankly, for that to happen. And now Modi is facing re-election next year. Uh, He's extremely popular, and if anything, uh, the current spat 
uh, uh, works, uh, you know, plays well for him. You know, he has this kind of strong image, uh, you know, strong man, if you want to use the word image. Uh, and he's now standing up and, and you know, taking very aggressive steps uh, now against Canada, showing, look, you know, we won't be pushed around, we won't be bullied. Uh, that's playing well uh, for him at home. Uh, so I just don't see how at this point anything can possibly happen. I mean, it would be really just kind of a parlor game, honestly, at this point to speculate on how this could go forward. Uh, but if we look back, you know, it doesn't have to be this way. At the time that Stephen Harper was prime minister, uh, there was a, a real uptick in, in Canada-India ties. Harper and Modi met several times. They had a real a real camaraderie, and that, that came through, you know, at their various meetings. Um, and, you know, that, that was never the case for Trudeau, and now it's gone really from bad to worse. So Obviously, a lot of the West is looking at India as a potential bulwark against China's growing influence in the Indo-Pacific. I'm wondering if you could touch on, you know, how India's influence in international geopolitics has evolved over the past few decades and maybe briefly uh, touch on the ways in which India's rise could potentially serve as a counterbalance to China's growing influence. You know, broadly speaking, as India's economy has grown over the last uh, 20 or 30 years, its power has grown on the world stage. I mean, you know, uh, China being the obvious uh, exemplar here. I mean, China is what it is now because it's had 30 years, what, of 10% uh, growth. Uh, so they're, they've got huge economic might, huge, huge military might. Now, India is uh, only a fraction, about a third of the size of China. Its military is nowhere near, uh, you know, uh, China's. But then... There is the soft power advantage of being the world's largest democracy uh, that does carry some weight, some moral weight. Uh, and again, you know, with, with, uh, but, but I mean, so India is becoming more important whether anyone likes it or not. I mean, who else is there in Asia that could be a credible possible counterweight to China? India and China, you know, share a border together that's about one third of the world's population. They have their own dispute their own border dispute, uh, you know, as well. And Chinese maps show parts, you know, they've shown parts of various countries on, on, on their official maps, you know, India, Taiwan. So, uh, if, you know, if not India, then who? Not certainly not Pakistan, which is now sort of imploding, uh, you know, is, is a kind of well, basically a failed state. Uh, which other countries are there in that region? And I, and I think India uh, understands that they now are more important to the West uh, but they made it, you know, if, if you listen to what they say, uh, particularly their, uh, you know, the, their, their South Bloc mandarins, uh, you know, Jay Shankar, who was, who was a foreign minister, but was a foreign secretary, you know, the, 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 the top bureaucrat, says very clearly, look, my job is to look after India's national interest, and I'll do, do what it takes. So if we, if we have to buy cheap natural gas, uh, for, you know, if, 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 if we have to buy cheap Russian natural gas, we'll do that. Uh, and we also want to be friends, you know, with the U.S. So they're not going to be uh, sort of signing on as, you know, just purely a Western partner. They are going to be still uh, doing deals with Russia, uh, you know, unless someone shows them a cheaper alternative. You know, where where else will India, which is, which is very energy hungry, get uh, such a, such cheap natural gas? So I think. You know, there, we have to be we have to be sort of realistic in terms of what we can expect from India here. I mean, they're looking after themselves, uh, and uh, they, which means that they will, I think, selectively, you know, issue by issue, or uh, work with the West, try to contain China, but also uh, keep close ties with with uh, you know with with regimes that we don't like, Russia, obviously. Dr. Dehigia, it's been great having you, and I'm grateful that you could share some of your insights and expertise with us today. That's all for this week's episode of the CDA Institute Expert Series. To learn more about the CDA Institute, you can visit our website at cdainstitute.ca or subscribe to our newsletter. Thanks, and we hope you'll be joining us next week.